Okay, I can't see you all, so um, like yell at me if I'm going over or something. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to talk about designing for user-friendly diagnostics, and uh, thanks a lot to Anna, who previously worked in my lab and is now off doing her own PhD, and all the organizers for inviting me. Um, when we talk about diagnostics, we, we have to think about like where we're actually going to use them. And so my lab focuses on point-of-care diagnostics, and um, but the point of care, at least in the United States, is 90% within referral and district hospitals, whereas what we want to work on is things that can go anywhere into the clinics and into the field um, where you could use this without any previous knowledge of uh, the devices. Um, so as a quick intro, Purdue is sort of in the Midwest of the United States in the middle of um, nowhere. <laughs> um, near no oceans or anything, but it is a very pretty place. And um, most of my work is in global health, but lately that uh, last four months has involved sitting at home uh, as there's not much travel happening. Uh, I wanna note that uh, a lot of diagnostics, no matter well, if I can move the screen, um, have the same technical requirements, very, very broadly speaking, from um, which means you have to collect a sample, prepare your sample, um, perform some sort of signal amplification, whether that is uh, collecting nanoparticles in one place for a visual line to appear, or whether that is amplify your um, amplifying the uh, sorry, nucleic acids that you're looking at, uh, and then detect that signal and you end up with a result. The way that people go about that is really broad. Um, and so one of my favorite examples is probably one of the very first point of care tests that has been developed, except I can't change my screen. There we go. Um, which is something like the home pregnancy test that has been around since 1985 and is the quintessential lateral flow test that we think of for pregnancy, malaria, HIV, used around the world. Um, in 1985, they were not quite what you would imagine now. They're three steps with a cap and a handle and lots of timing. Um, the principle of uh, immunoassay-based detection hasn't changed, but the usability has changed a lot. And so in order to make this a test that people can use at home, uh, the Clearview rapid test that is uh, available here in the United States has a lot of usability features that have been added. Um, so for women who are not sure that they're able to get the sample correctly, there's a color change tip. Um, they've changed the line development to have a plus or a minus for positive and negative. The speed of the assay is, is vastly increased from 30 minutes to just one to three minutes. Um, and then um, features like the handle have been improved. And these are mostly not technical advances so much as usability in the need um, to get more of the market share. Uh, so they've, they've pushed the products forward because the actual um, immunoassay process hasn't really changed that much. But advances in the papers used and the antibodies uh, have really helped to improve things. And I was in the breakout room with uh, Dr. Land, which was fantastic as a co his, um, was the first author on the reassured criteria for users, uh, which talks about uh, many different critical aspects of diagnostic tests. And um, I wanna note that a lot of these are actually focused on the user themselves. So um, specimen collection, affordability, user friendliness, um, rapid tests, robust, those are all about where the test is going to be used and how it's going to be used and by whom. So when you look at user challenges, there's a, a few different things that people uh, report. Things like faint lines um, and they can't tell if it's positive or negative. Uh, whether the providers, so who's doing the test, if it's not one person doing their own test, if they're running it uh, in a lab or in a, a provider setting, then um, the problem is that that person would get interrupted by needing to do other things. Patients who are left waiting too long for results may not be willing to stick around. 
Uh, and then a lot of multi-step tests uh, take are too long and uh, even if they could be implemented would require new staff, which has a whole other level of expense um, compared to say a, a really cheap test itself, um, but the added cost of people that can run them. So when uh, the same uh, authors asked uh, individuals what their ideal test would look like, it was a lot of really simple things that go back to those reassured criteria. Something that lays flat so it doesn't fall over. Something that's simple to use so that it's one step instead of five. Um, anything that's quicker is good. Anything that is uh, cheaper is better. And uh, the highest sensitivity and specificity that you can get are uh, really important. Uh, what that means when you're designing your test uh, is, you know, that's, that's great. It, we all want a super fast, super perfect test, uh, but how? And so as you're looking at how to do this, uh, my colleagues and I helped uh, to develop this um, product uh, framework. So uh, to develop a product hypothesis where you're evaluating who are your users, what is the context they're using this in, and what is the need that they're trying to solve? Uh, and then um, preparing to go into the fields, engaging with those actual uh, users and potential users, synthesizing that information and repeating this process over again. Um, so when you do the product hypothesis development, you wanna consider your critical assumptions. What needs to happen for this product to reach its intended impact? Um, so the need, uh, not you know, just that it has high sensitivity, high specificity, but what is it that the person needs it for? Um, why is it worth their time and money to use this device? Because uh, in some cases, it may not be worth their time and money and you may have your assumption wrong. Or it may be that uh, the user who you thought would use it is not actually the person that ultimately uh, is using the device. And they may have different training or it may be in a different context. Uh, so it's important to at least come up with these high assumptions before you are um, getting too far along the line of the development. So in the context, where will it be used? What resources are available? And what does the device need to do? I'm going to, um, and then you, you put these all together into that uh, hypothesis that your users need to do something which meets uh, the most important design criteria that you're already developing around in order to meet the need within the specific context. So I'll give an example of a technology that I've been working on um, and now as uh, a, a small company. So uh, Omniviz is the company. I'm one of the co-founders in it. So uh, take everything with a grain of salt. Um, I'm not going to tell you too much about the technology. They, we have publications on that, which are cool, but the important part here is the, the usability of the device. So uh, the idea is that you can add water, start the device, get the results, uh, and the disposable piece, that little chip on the um, side of the screen is the only part that would be a re uh, uh, cost over time. Uh, so Omnivis had this uh, idea that the need, and this is actually even before the company started, um, a few years ago, that we wanted to be able to proactively detect and track toxigenic V. cholera contamination in drinking and recreational water to prevent cholera infections, uh, presuming that the users would be either uh, field technician, technicians performing routine surveillance, or um, maybe, uh, I didn't put this in there, but maybe even individuals who wanted to test their own water. And the context would be on-site monitoring at the water source, uh, access to wireless communication either um, soon or, or on site or very soon after, and then that their time would be limited. If it's a user individual, they would need to drink the water or find another source. If it's a technician, they need to go to different sources uh, and test multiple sites. So uh, picking one of these users as their primary individual um, so our, the thought was that individuals need an on-site method to detect as a few as a thousand B. cholera bacteria per milliliter from drinking and recreational water samples within 30 minutes in order to proactively alert uh, residents um, and family members to potential contamination and find an alternative drinking source. So uh, in 2016, when we started this project, 21% uh, of the worldwide cases were in Haiti. And so um, 
we went to Haiti to learn more about the problem. My graduate student, uh, Taylor Melling, who's the white girl in there, uh, spent uh, her summer of 2016 uh, working with uh, all of these amazing colleagues at the Emerging Pathogens Institute who uh, range from graduate students to field technicians to um, PhD researchers uh, working on a number of different diseases. And they let her stay there a few months before they let me come visit and see what, uh, how they are doing monitoring. And uh, we went to different sites uh, where they do monitoring and where individuals collect drinking water. And so uh, critical is to learn about the context. This is clean drinking water that is uh, trucked in. It's very different than collecting water from over here, which is the sewage and the river runoff. However, when it floods, this sewer runover um, actually runs up into the drinking water and that's where you could have problems. So uh, there's some challenges with the type of water sample that we're gonna be getting. We also, uh, after talking to people, we realized that many of the lab members in the lab that are working in, in my lab that are working on this would never, uh, we would not be able to afford to take everybody to the site that they wanna to go to. But we can run practice tests in the lab in our own community and collect water samples and then uh, run the test in this tiny clear plastic chip, which is completely invisible, uh, which is one of the things that we realized is gonna be a usability problem, uh, along with the, the particles photo bleach and that we're looking at so we can't see them, the phone screen is difficult to see, and, and we're able to find lots of usability challenges simply by um, running a practice test close to home. And so as you have uh, some, some technology that you're developing, as you're getting close with your di diagnostic devices, I strongly encourage everyone to get out of their lab. And even if you just take it um, back to your own house and run it with water instead of your real um, saliva or nasal or blood samples, you can see what happens when it turns out you need access to a pipette uh, rather than um, the squeeze bulbs that you thought it would work because there's some challenges in getting uh, the sample where you want it to go. And one of the biggest issues I would say is getting a sample from the individual you're taking it from into your test. There's so many ways that that can go wrong. Uh, and so figuring out that during the test uh, process development is really one of the critical aspects. So in the case of the Omniviz device, we um, went back and, and refined the need um, to focus solely on um, proactive detection and prevention. The users uh, focused on the, the field technicians and not an individual because uh, the cost wasn't gonna be feasible for an individual and um, the field technicians the, the community organizations could go, then go out and uh, let people know in the community that there has been an uh, issue and they need to boil water. They would have some previous training in water collection and monitoring, so they're better trained than we expected. And the context, um, the, the time limitedness is not gonna be for an individual to drink the water, but the need to visit multiple sites per day to get lots of um, sampling done. And so we refine the product hypothesis to say that field te technicians need an on-site monitoring source um, for a few as 10 Vibrio cholerae. And we also found that we needed one liter of drinking water, not uh, the few microliters that go into the test uh, and uh, recreational water within 30 minutes in order to proactively alert residents to potential contamination. So we got lots of information out of talking to the people that are gonna use these devices and getting out of the lab we also do this for other tests in my, uh, in my lab, whether we're doing blood tests for HIV, we go out and talk to providers um, and to patients to understand what it is that is stopping them or helping them to get where they need to go um, and to get the disease testing that they need, uh, whether that's a lateral flow test or a smartphone test. Um, and I think that's really critical to go from, you know, the lab-based assay to uh, something that's going to be a product in the field. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll open it up to a few questions. We won't 
keep you for, for terribly long if you have somewhere to go, but we'll also just um, not in a rush to leave the room if people want to continue conversations as well. So we'll take a few questions for Jackie first, either in chat or just unmute yourself. Well, I'm also happy to share um, some of the publications that I referenced there. I saw Jenny put in um, the reassured paper. The one, um, that product hypothesis one is, is based on a book chapter, but I can, um, so it's not open source, but I'm happy to provide it to anybody that would like it. Thanks, that would be great. Um, and thanks for the excellent talk. It was, um, these are topics I've been thinking about for a while and it's nice to know there's other people working out there on with similar approaches uh, and um, doing some great practical work towards kind of improving usability. Um, one question I had is that in medical devices, a lot of times your user and your beneficiary aren't the same person. And I was wondering how you looked at addressing that in kind of this product hypothesis model that you've built. Yeah, in the so we go into depth in the chapter and um, you want to talk to not just one potential user, but all the potential individuals. So that's why we had looked at the people that would be ultimately beneficiaries, the community members, as well as the, the test users. Um, and so part of that user is to list everybody who could benefit and, and all of the stakeholders. Because um, there's also plenty of other ways to fail, like not engaging the right manufacturers or not engaging the um, political- or the regulators as we were talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so this, this one focused solely on the, the people actually running the test, but finding out who that person is, is really, you have to look broadly. We have a few questions in the chat, if you can see that, or I can read them to you. Um, let's see. So from Keith Moore, do you think it's more common that not to change the product profile more than once along the way, um, an adaptive design? I think that the earlier you can start developing it, the better, so that you have a chance to change it multiple times. Often what happens is everybody focuses solely on the, the technical specs of the sensitivity and the specificity, um, in the lab and the analytical aspects, and then they forget about the user aspects, which can totally screw up all of your perfect tests if they're not running it the way you thought they would. Um, so I think it's good to adapt, but a, a lot of my understanding, once you get to the manufacturing stage and you've invested in that, it may be a little bit late. Um, so we, we talk about like that cycle very early on. So that you have a chance for more than one. There's another question from Eric. So great talk, thanks. What challenges can people learn more about to help your team and deliver, develop solutions for? Um, I'm not sure I know what you mean. Eric, do you want to expand? <laughs> yeah, uh, great to see you again. Um, so I'm just trying to get, you know, more people involved in the solutions you're trying to provide or, you know, folks that are interested in the things you're developing to, um, you know, get get information and join the, the fight to develop solutions for third world countries or, um, you know, low cost solutions. So that's all. Go Boilermakers. Oh, yeah. Um, so I would argue, um, I in some cases, the uh, what's in it for me aspect is that uh, all of our countries are resource limited when you flood them with COVID-19 and suddenly <laughs> your New York City has a field hospital. Um, and so we should all be interested in, in diagnostics because it's personally relevant to all of us. Uh, and that a lot of the stuff that's happening, um, at least with our collaborators in, in Kenya and in Haiti and Ecuador, are doing work that we can't do because of regulatory issues and um, because for example the the way that things are set is that it's you know we have to do based on the current platforms that already exist whereas they are developing entirely new platforms and um, are proving those that then we can come bring back uh, and and improve as well so um, it's a two-way street for sure 
uh, Kevin Land said, sample prep and sample introduction to the device still seems one of the biggest issues for development. Yes. So we have found um, that we, we, even in our lab, we've been struggling with how do we get a blood sample from a finger prick to some of the, the HIV devices that we're doing? Um, and how do we, in our case, try to eliminate as much sample prep as possible? And that is dependent on some really robust enzymes. So we need all of you to develop those so that they can work in 100% blood and 100% saliva. And that will help limit all of our issues with extra dilution steps. But yeah, we are we are limited a lot by the biology, uh, and and what is uh, in existence for sure. Okay, maybe this this last question from oh no, we have two more. <laughs> last so the, question from yeah, go ahead. Sorry. The quick answer: the enzymes we're using are are BST from NEB from lamp, uh, and for lamp assays. And the influence is the choice of technology for use in the diagnostic test development. So uh, I think the, the short wrong, yeah, 2.0 and 3.0. <laughs> the short wrong answer is uh, people use the, the technology that they are comfortable with and that they like and that they have developed because it's their pet uh, you know, nucleic acid method instead of what is the best option. Uh, so in our case, we, I've been trying to be more broad in, you know, whether we use an electrochemical detection, a visual detection, a fluorescent detection, whether we use nucleic acids or proteins and try and get early on what are the actual needs of the users rather than what are we already good at. Um, but I do like LAMP for isothermal methods because it is robust more compared to the HDA that we've used um, and uh, We've tried to get RPA up and running, but I've struggled with that. And so there's, there's definite advantages um, to like choosing one method and getting really good at it. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I'm sure you know, people have many more questions they would like to know the answer to, but we'll, we'll save those for a future symposium date or uh, on the reclone forum. Um, I'll keep the room open for a little bit just if people want to make a couple connections. I saw some stuff happening in the chat, um, but this will conclude the, the formal part of our program. <laughs>